If you've ever tried to figure out what really drives market returns, you're just drowning in data. Oh, completely. It's overwhelming. The sheer number of strategies and these risk premiums is just mind boggling. We're swimming in what the financial economist John Cochran famously called the factor zoo. Back in 2011, yeah. And it's only gotten bigger. Hundreds and hundreds of factors, all supposedly explaining expected returns. So how do you find the actual signal in all of that noise? That's the real question. And the sources you shared with us today, they focus on this huge, very practical problem within that factor zoo. If you want to build an optimal, high-performing portfolio, the classic mean variance portfolio, how in the world do you choose which of those hundreds of factors you should actually invest in? That is the mission, and it's a critical one. Because the traditional methods, they often fail. They fail catastrophically in this kind of high-dimensional environment. So today, we're going to unpack a really compelling machine learning strategy that was developed to address this exact failure. It's called the scaled factor portfolio. And we really need to understand the mechanism behind it, this thing called scaled principal component analysis or scaled PCA, and figure out why it can deliver performance that the traditional methods completely miss. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. So this core strategy, it's a two-step process, and it was applied to this massive historical data set, 50 equity anomaly portfolios running from, what, 1974 to 2019? A really long and robust data set. And the steps are, first, the scaled PCA, and second, imposing some structure by shrinking the cross-section. So let's dive in and start with why the traditional approach just falls short. We almost always have to start with Markowitz, right? It's the foundation, can't avoid it. His mean variance portfolio theory is the bedrock. It tells us that your allocation relies only on an asset's mean, its variance, and its covariance. The first and second moments of returns, as the academics would say. And when finance professionals try to tackle this factor zoo, they often turn to a statistical tool called principal component analysis, or PCA. Standard dimension reduction. Exactly. PCA is great because it effectively extracts factors based on common co-movement, the structure of how things move together. It's purely focused on that second moment information on the variance. But that's also its biggest weakness, isn't it? It's the fundamental flaw when it comes to investing. It finds these patterns of co-movement, but it does that regardless of whether those patterns actually generate high returns. So it completely ignores the expected return information, the first moment. Completely. Imagine you're trying to find the most profitable oil fields, but you only study local traffic patterns. You might find some really interesting clusters of movement, but you have Absolutely no idea if those clusters correspond to where the oil actually is. That's a great analogy. So if the true investment signal, that risk premium you want to capture, is weak relative mm -hmm. to all the noise and variance in the system. Which it often is. Then traditional PCA is just going to fail. It's not going to extract the components that are actually useful for an investor who's trying to maximize their risk-adjusted returns. It just picks the biggest statistical variance components. Or the biggest return components. So here's a light bulb moment then. We need a method that can mathematically bake the expected return information right into the dimension reduction process itself. And that is precisely what the scale PCA method does. It's a really elegant solution. So how does it work? Before you even start extracting the principal components, the very first thing you do is you scale or you weight the underlying factors by their individual Sharpe ratio. Ah, the Sharpe ratio. Classic risk-adjusted return metric. It tells us how much excess return we're getting for each unit of volatility we take on. Exactly. So the moment you scale the factor by its own Sharpe ratio, the resulting scaled principal components automatically incorporate both things we care about. The co-movement. The second moment. And the expected return, the first moment, simultaneously. Yeah. Okay, but wait, here's a critical question for you, the learner. If we're scaling everything based on the historical Sharpe ratio, aren't we just baking past luck into the model? How does this scaling process avoid a major look-ahead bias problem? 
That's a really probing question, and it gets right to the heart of estimation risk. The key here is that we're not trying to perfectly predict the future Sharpe ratio. That's impossible. We're using the historical realized Sharpe ratio as a reasonable proxy for the required compensation for risk. Okay, so it's a proxy. Yes. The source paper shows that for a mean variance investor, assigning more weight to factors that have historically shown a higher Sharpe ratio during the extraction process, well, it's an intuitively and empirically optimal way to prioritize components that have a significant risk premium. It's about structuring the factor space to value premium over just pure covariance. And you can see how this priority shift dramatically affects the factor weighting. Oh, it's night and day. The analysis clearly shows scaled PCA assigning significantly more weight to high sharp ratio factors, things like return on market equity, which had a really strong annualized sharp of 0.82. And on the other side. On the flip side, it marginalized, it pushed down the factors with weak or even negative signals, things like the size factor with a sharp of 0.15, or sales growth, which was actually negative at minus 0.04. It forces your capital to concentrate on the strong signals. And just for context, there are other methods out there, right? Like risk premium PCA. They also try to bring in the expected return. They do, but they often do it indirectly. They might add a penalty on the pricing error later on in the process. The genius of scaled PCA lies in its directness. It's yeah. that intuitive first step of adjusting the data input itself using the Sharpe ratio. Now we can move to the second critical stage. And this is really the necessary safety net dealing with estimation risk. Because even if scaled PCA extracts the absolute best possible combination of factors, if we then go and use conventional portfolio allocation methods, what people often call the plug-in method, we are just doomed to fail in a high dimensional setting. And what does that failure look like for an investor in practical terms? It looks like spurious overfitting. Your model will perfectly explain the past data. It finds all the little bits of noise and it treats them like they're a real signal. This results in incredibly high simulated in sample returns. So on paper, it looks like you found a magic formula. Exactly. But the moment you take that portfolio out into the real world out of sample, the performance just collapses because you modeled random noise instead of a persistent signal. The classic trap. So the second step is crucial. We have to impose some kind of structural discipline. We have to shrink the cross-section. And this is done using penalized linear regressions, specifically things like ridge regression or the elastic net. And ridge regression, that's not just a statistical trick, it's an economic constraint. Precisely. That's the perfect way to put it. Think of it like imposing a really strict budget on your model's complexity. Okay. A standard plug-in method might give these tiny volatile weights to dozens of different factors, trying to perfectly match every little wiggle in the historical data. Ridge regression applies a penalty that discourages that kind of complexity. So what does it penalize? It penalizes the maximum squared sharp ratio of the final factor portfolio. By doing that, it limits the size of the factor weights, which stabilizes the performance. It literally stops a model from betting the farm on these volatile overfitting factors. That shrinkage, that stability, that's absolutely essential for any kind of real world prediction. And we can't forget one final data prep step that sort of underpins the whole process. What's that? Before any PCA extraction happens, all 50 of those equity anomaly factors were first market adjusted or demarketed. Think of it like you're trying to have a conversation in a loud room. The market return is the loudest voice. It's a huge element. So you take it out of the room so you can clearly hear how the other 50 smaller elements, the anomaly factors, are interacting with each other. I see. This step stabilizes the estimation of that variance covariance matrix, and it prevents the first few principal components from just being highly correlated with the aggregate market return. We want our factors to capture cross-sectional anomalies, not just market beta. So Okay, you combine the sharp ratio scaling with the ridge regression shrinkage. What does this whole framework actually mean for real world performance? Let's focus on the critical out of sample results because that's what really matters to you, the learner. This was done using a 120 month rolling window for prediction. And the comparison is it's dark. The scaled PCA showed unequivocally superior out of sample performance, both in terms of sharp ratio and what's called the certainty equivalent rate, or CER. And this was when benchmark against both traditional PCA and that other method, risk premium PCA. How much better are we talking? It's not just better, it's more efficient. What's fascinating is the sheer efficiency. Scaled PCA achieved its near maximum out of sample annualized sharp ratio when the portfolio was invested in only around eight factors. Only eight? Just eight. 
Traditional PCA, by contrast, it needed nearly 50% more factors, around 12 of them, just to get close to its peak performance, which was lower anyway. The scaling mechanism is just extremely effective at filtering out the noise quickly. And the data on concentration really brings that point home, doesn't it? Yeah. This strategy seems fantastic at focusing capital where it matters most. It really is. The scaled PCA portfolio allocated a whopping 79.2% of its total absolute weight to just the first 15 underlying factors with the highest Sharpe ratios. Wow. Okay, this strategy is getting almost 80% of its performance by focusing capital on just a handful of strong signals. That's it. It means you don't need to go chase 50 different factors and incur all the transaction costs and the complexities that come with that kind of broad exposure. And how did traditional PCA compare on that concentration metric? Not even close. It allocated only 48.8% of its weight to those same top 15 factors. That right there is the empirical proof. The sharp ratio scaling step successfully identifies and concentrates on the factors with the strongest, most enduring risk-adjusted signals. And what's really important for us is how robust these results are. The research team rigorously tested this. They didn't just find one setting where it worked. Absolutely. The relative superiority of scaled PCA was maintained even when they changed the estimation approach. For example, they tried using an expanding window instead of a rolling one. Still better. They used a much longer 240-month rolling window. Still held up. Still held up. And even when they ran the tests without that initial market adjusting step we just talked about, scaled PCA still maintained its significant edge over the benchmarks. Now, moving beyond just the investment profits, this research has some really profound asset pricing implications. Okay, let's unpack that. Academically, the optimal factor investing portfolio is, in theory, equivalent to the mean variance efficient, or MVE, portfolio. And that MDE portfolio structure, in turn, implies the structure of something called the stochastic discount factor, or SDF. The SDF, right. The core academic model that's used to price all assets. That's the one. So this means we can judge the success of the scaled PCA not just by its returns, but by how well it defines a model that should, in theory, explain returns universally. And we're looking at Table 5 from the source, which compares the MDE portfolio implied by scaled PCA against all the popular asset pricing models, CAPM, the Fama French models, and so on. And this is where we see that just staggering result. The MVE portfolio that was constructed using scaled PCA, it generated massive statistically significant abnormal returns, or alphas, against every single one of the nine asset pricing models they tested. Every single one. For example, against the classic capital asset pricing model, the CAPM, the Scaled PCA MV portfolio, generated an annualized alpha of 19.02%, and that's significant at the 1% level. That is the critical finding. An alpha of nearly 20% against established benchmarks is pretty powerful evidence that the scaled PCA method extracts components that are fundamentally missed by standard risk models. So those models simply cannot explain where that performance is coming from. They can't. It proves that the MVE portfolio implied by scaled PCA is tapping into systematic risk premiums that the existing academic literature just fails to properly capture. And if we look at the SDF capability, that superior fit is validated there too, isn't it? It is, yeah. The SDF implied by the scaled PCA MVE portfolio explains a larger percentage of the 50 underlying anomalies than the traditional PCA method does. What's an example of that? For instance, when they constructed a model with just five factors, traditional PCA failed to explain 14 of the factors at the 5% significance level. Scaled PCA, using the same number of factors, failed to explain only nine. It just shows that the factor structure derived using the sharp ratio scaling provides a much better, more robust fit for explaining the cross-section of returns in general. Okay, so to summarize the major contributions of this work for you, the learner, you've seen how two critical machine learning steps can fundamentally solve this factor zoo problem. First, incorporating the sharp ratio into the dimension reduction process. It fundamentally changes principal component analysis by prioritizing that necessary first moment or return information over just pure co-movement. And second, combining that scaled approach with disciplined ridge regression helps you avoid that classic financial problem of spurious overfitting in a high dimensional factor space. It imposes an economically meaningful penalty. And that results in a stable factor investing strategy that is demonstrably better suited to real world out of sample prediction than the traditional methods. That's the bottom line. So here's a final thought. 
if merely adjusting how we filter risk factors based on their historical risk-adjusted return can yield such large, persistent, abnormal returns, what else are traditional financial models failing to capture in the fundamental structure of the factor zoo? That's a huge question. Perhaps the machine learning revolution isn't just about big data, but about injecting better, more economically sound intuition into our core portfolio construction algorithms.